Okay, well, some of you I know own horses, or you like horses, or you've ridden horses. Uh, hor they're amazing, right? They're beautiful, intelligent, grand animals uh, of our kids. I think Chandler was the one who really <laughs> loved horses. In fact, we just found a little stuffed horse that she had. I don't know how it's still in our garage, but I took a tour, and she, she was like, oh, you know, brings back all those memories back in the day. But uh, these uh, amazing creatures are going to be a big feature here for us in uh, Revelation chapter 6, except they're going to be four terrible, terrifying steeds. These are really uh, intimidating horses because we're going to be moving into the most dark and dreadful scenes that I'm aware of in all of Scripture. And it starts here in chapter 6 of Revelation. Uh, what is going to be described for us today as we unpack the scriptures is really the horrors that are on the horizon. Uh, this is going to describe for us a future fear that's going to be coming, a prophetic picture, if you will, that's soon to come. But the shadows of the future, you can hear the galloping already. Um, some of us just in these last few years of COVID have gotten a little bit of taste of government overreach and the cruelty that people can have towards one another, uh, the, the splitting and the warring and the Ukraine and the Russia. And the, the, like you can hear the hoofbeats of these four horsemen uh, already now, but they're going to get louder as the future <laughs> unfolds. Um, the Bible talks about the end of history approaching, and these galloping horses are symbolic of kind of that future that's coming. And uh, it's, it's a little bit scary, of course, for us who are in Christ. It, the dawning of a glorious eternal life is coming for us. So we have hope. We know that we're, we're on the other side of the dread. But it's still, it's still a little bit much. Um, horses are mentioned over 300 times in Scripture. But today we're going to look at the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, they are probably the four most famous horses in <laughs> all of Scripture. Uh, but they're famous, but they're fierce and fiery and kind of intimidating because they're war horses. And they have heaving flanks and flared nostrils, and they kind of are rearing their way towards the future. And they strike fear into a lot of people. And, uh, they, you know, their, their power kind of reverberate, ver reverberates even today. We are moving from chapter 1 of Revelation where Jesus was among the churches and he saw them as seven lights. And then we moved into Revelation 2 and 3 where he actually talks to each of the seven key churches in the ancient world and has a little message for each of them. Then we moved uh, in chapter 4 and 5, John got a vision of heaven. So we all of a sudden were like transported into... <laughs> Like the, the throne room, it kind of opened up and John got inspired that, oh, even though it's kind of crazy on the earth, God is in control and he has a plan for us. Now we're moving back from heaven back to earth and now he's getting a vision of what's coming in the future for those who have not been taken up or raptured, those who are not believers in Christ. What does the future hold? And it's really challenging. Some call this the action part of Scripture. And the tribulation starts today in chapter 6. And it goes all the way through chapter 19. It's a seven-year period on earth. And that seven-year period is dicey. It's dicey. It kind of reminds me of like a, like a Western movie, but like a really dark, scary, like with all that music, you know, you know, just eerie music, like, I shouldn't be at this okay corral. It doesn't feel okay. It's, it's kind of a bad Western movie with these four mysterious writers and their ghoulish steeds, and they're bringing kind of evil tidings about kind of what's going to happen in the future. And uh, God's giving us a little bit of vision of that so that it might quicken us. It might awaken us to live boldly today. And by the way, it has done that all week as I've been studying the passage. I'm like, I got to talk to people about Christ. Like, you want to come to Christ now. You do not want to be here when these writers arrive. It's scary. 
Revelation teaches that the world is not headed towards really ultimate peace and unity. It will have a fabricated kind of peace that it's looking for, but it's actually moving towards a final uh, cataclysm cataclysmic, if you will, war, the Battle of Armageddon, um, that the greatest holocaust in human history is still ahead for us, that the world is actually deteriorating and moving into chaos and confusion and sin, and that as the world kind of unfolds, wars are going to increase, crime's going to increase, economic upheaval will increase, unprecedented natural disasters like earthquakes, floods, famine, and disease will increase. That in other words, we're going to be moving out of what we're in right now, which helps me to appreciate what we're in. We're in an age of grace. We're in an age of grace. God is holding back evil. He's restraining it for a period that people could actually freely just come to the Lord right now, like just, I want to have a relationship with the Lord and open my heart to him and he's going to allow it. But we're going to have that age of grace come to an end. That chapter is going to turn and we're going to move into a period of judgment. The, the game will end. The clock will hit zero and it's like, okay, now it's time to look at the score. And if you don't have the Lord, you're going to be in trouble. Um, and this chapter kind of takes us into the outpouring of God's wrath and how that's going to impact a fallen rebellious, really God-rejecting world. Um, I was thinking about the just John seeing this vision of these horses galloping and coming toward and just hearing that sound. And it kind of reminded me of uh, a Disney movie. I don't know if you recall a stampede. Uh, it was the first stampede that came to my mind when I was thinking, okay, what would it be like to be in a stampede? Um, I'm not from Texas. I haven't uh, been in, th you know, the Rio Grande or anything, but uh, it just reminded me of the 1994 movie. That's over almost 30 years ago. Uh, Lion King. Do you remember that famous scene? Simba goes down into this gorge and all of a sudden you hear all this rumbling and sound and it's like, you know, everything starts to shake and little Simba's scared and of course is King father Mufasa uh, is heroic and goes down and saves him you know from this impending disaster and Mufasa finds his way back up out of the gorge but then when he gets to the top of the gorge his envious jealous brother Scar um, Cain and Abel um, all of a sudden you know pushes him back right and he can't get out of the gorge and he is stampeded he's utterly crushed and it's just horrifying. It's like when I saw Bambi, I'm like, I thought this was a Disney. I thought it was supposed to be happy, but Disney's going south, people, so <laughs> it's, yikes. Anyways, uh, this is a stampede that we're not going to get out of um, if we don't know Christ. So it's like, gosh, it, it makes me want to warn people, you know, please come to the Lord. There have been dark periods in human history, as you know, um, the Dark Ages, the American Civil War, uh, the two world wars, the Great Depression. This is going to be the darkest ever. Um, we're aware that government tyrants can bring darkness to their regions. Uh, Nero did it in Rome, and Hitler did it in Germany, and Pol Pot did it in Cambodia, and Mao did it in China. And, you know, you can turn a country into a really dark place, not just physical chaos, but moral darkness. We've seen that in history, but this coming period that, that Revelation 6 is talking about is going to be the worst by far. It's going to be the darkest. It's going to be the worst period in human history. Now, the Bible calls it in Revelation 6 the wrath of the Lamb. Paul talks about it in 1 Thessalonians 5, the day of the Lord. Jeremiah talks about it as the time of Jacob's trouble. Some simply refer to this period as the tribulation, but it's going to be bad. Daniel prophesied about it. He said, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time, Daniel 12. And Jesus actually predicts this, recorded for us in Matthew 24. He says, there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, 
nor ever shall be. And he's kind of forecasting for us, wow, that's what's coming. So there's a stampede of terror that is coming and there's these writers of wrath that are going to bring kind of the judgments of God. They're going to come, 21 of them. They're going to start with what we call seven seals. Remember there's a seal is a rolled up papyrus document and then you melt the wax and seal it. There's going to be seven seals and each one is going to reveal a judgment. Each time Jesus opens the seal, he'll reveal a judgment on those who've rejected God. And from the seven seals, we'll find out when we open the seven seals, there's now seven trumpets. And trumpets were kind of military warnings. Do -do, do -do -do -do. You know, they had different pitches and different tones that kind of said, da -da 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 -da. everyone knows that one is charge, char, right? They had different things that went, but these were the warning tr trumpets. And there'll be seven of those. And then when we open after the seventh trumpet, we're going to get seven bowls. Bowls are uh, literally like uh, vessels that are going to be symbolized as like pouring judgment, pouring lava, pouring uh, wrath on the earth. So we've got seven seals followed by seven trumpets followed by seven bowls. It's like, oh no, this is just, we're moving into like a terrible period. Now again, uh, let me just say, if you're a believer, a true believer, you have opened your heart to Jesus Christ, he's your Lord and Savior, and you live for him, what we're going to start unpacking is not for you. Should we stop there? <laughs> I mean, that's super important because John got a vision that he was called up to heaven in, you know, John's in Alcatraz, right? He's uh, being exiled, you know, he's already imprisoned by the government. And God says, let me give you a vision of what's going to happen here. You're g you guys are going to be called up just as John was called up. God, Jesus said, come up here. I want to give you a window. We're going to go up with him. When that was a, a vision of the rapture, but when the rapture happened, we're going to be taken out. And so this is not for us. That's why like, gosh, my evangelism went way up this week. I'm like, I want to tell everyone like, you know, you can accept the Lord right now free, like free, like you don't have to go through hell on earth. Um, so anyways, it gets me a little emotional because I get super excited like, wow, I thank you for sparing us. You don't have to do that. Um, but I'm a pre-tribber. Um, theologically, that means I believe the church will be raptured and taken out prior to the seven-year tribulation period. And part of the, the emphasis of that is, again, the church was talked about in chapter 2. We looked at the seven churches, and he's talking about the church. The church is never mentioned from chapter 6 to 19. That's never even going to be mentioned. This is all what's going to happen on earth after the Christians have taken away. So this is, uh, in, hopefully that encourages you. Uh, this stampede of suffering that's coming is not good. Um, now it's called an apocalypse, and an apocalypse means a revelation. It, in other words, what we're looking at is not designed to confuse you. It's not designed to confound you. A revelation means to kind of remove the veil, to uncover. It means to reveal, to, to make clear. So I'm hoping we don't get stuck in minutia here, but we get clear what God was trying to tell John and what he's trying to tell us so that we're encouraged and we're not confused. In other words, a revelation, an apocalypse, is a revealing of reality that you may not see in your own natural state. He's going to try to, God's giving us a revelation that we wouldn't have figured out on our own. He's unveiling spiritual truths that we wouldn't figure out just naturally or physically, mentally. Can I say it a different way? He's exposing the matrix to us. A revelation is 
the red pill in a blue pill world. So he's going to try to give us an eye-opening red pill kind of awakening to reality, actuality, truth, and the sober, disturbing perspective that those in this world don't want to see and don't want to acknowledge and aren't really thinking about. He's going to say, I'm going to pull it back and you're going to see just by Elon Musk trying to buy Twitter, that Twitter may not really be a company. It may be actually run by governments. It may be part of Saudi Arabia. It may be like he's going to pull back that maybe the news isn't really truthful journalism. Maybe there's fake news. Maybe the state isn't really what we think it is. Maybe it's a deep state. Maybe the FBI did kill JFK or maybe the CIA. Like maybe we're going to pull back. I'm going to give you insight, John, and you fellow believers that Everything's not like you think it is. So, when I was studying this week, I, I don't know if you remember that old movie, Apocalypse Now. <laughs> Somehow that came into my mind. <laughs> That's Francis Ford Coppola's uh, movie, and there's a scene with just utter chaos and stuff, and a guy walks to the front lines, and, you know, everything's just blowing up, and it's just crazy land, and he's like, Who's in charge here? <laughs> I don't know. That scene came to my mind. But this passage kind of reminded me of that when these terrible things are starting to unfold for us. There's a sense of like, who's, who's running? This, this is crazy land. Um, and what is encouraging about Revelation 6 is that we already had Revelation 5. And in Revelation 5... When you ask the question, who's in charge here? God gave John a vision. Jesus is. What? He's in charge? It's not like the world's not just falling apart. No, the world's falling into place. He is in charge. And so if you recall last time when we were together, that chapter ends with Jesus going to the Father who had a seven-sealed scroll, and they asked who is worthy to take the scroll, and no one comes forward, and John starts breaking down because it's like, oh my goodness, no one can like get us out of this pit? And then Jesus stands up, and you realize this is a seven-sealed scroll, so this is a, an, a title deed. This is the title deed to the earth. This is a giant bankruptcy document. It would be like me coming to your house, and then you bringing a bunch of documents out, and you go... <laughs> Here they are, and it's like, oh my gosh, who has documents that thick for something? This must be like a house purchase or something. Oh, yeah, and we had a notary, and there's an assessment attached to it. It's like, we know exactly what it is, because how many documents have assessments and notarized, and, you know, it's like, it's a title deed. And Adam, we know, squandered our inheritance as rulers of the earth and abdicated governing to Satan who became a, a usurper and he's been like the ruler of the world now and he's really just a squatter. He doesn't own it. It's not his earth, but we didn't take it back. And Jesus takes the scroll, the scroll of destiny that was placed in his hands because he's worthy and he's in control and providence is on our side and our victory is imminent and as soon as he sh goes and takes the scroll, the title deed of the earth, pandemonium breaks out in heaven. I mean, everyone starts worshiping and singing and praising and worthy and they fall down. And it's like, oh my gosh, the Caesars are ruling. The Biden administration's doing crazy stuff. Immigration is like uh, melting down. It feels like no one's in control. Um, Disney's tanking. I mean, it's like, what the heck is going on here? And John gets a vision that Jesus just grabbed the scroll. Like, he's in control. He's, th he's the owner of the earth. He's going to redeem it. He's going to buy the land back. He's going to bring it back, even though we kind of lost it. So there's just this great elation in chapter 5, like, whew, it's like the Titanic survivors seeing the Carpathia pulling up or something. It's like, yes! Yeah. <laughs> These are those World War II Jews in Dachau, you know, when the Allied forces show up and they realize the war's over. And there's a sense of 
relief and joy, like the terror is done, like someone's going to come and save us. They have that because Jesus is here. So yes, who's in control here? It feels like the world's falling apart and God gives John a vision and you and I a vision. I'm in control. It's going to melt down, but don't worry. I'm coming back. I'm going to make it right. And before it really gets crazy, I'm taking you out. So <laughs> I'm a good father. I'm not going to let my children go through this craziness. Yes, it's crazy and it's hard now, but it's going to get really crazy. And I know there's people who are like, well, how could a loving God allow these four horsemen to come through? How could he allow this suffering? How could he allow this judgment? How could... I know, I know, I know. It's hard to think through. But we have a God of grace and what? Grace and truth. Head and heart. And he's a God of hope, but he's a God of reality as well. And so our God is going to redeem us, but those who refuse to be redeemed, he's going to judge. And they go together. You can't be loving seeing people treated the way they're treated and not do something about it. And God's super patient, even when he like destroyed the whole earth with the flood back in Genesis chapter six, he had Noah build a boat and gave the people 120 years to get their head in the ball game. I'm not gonna tolerate this crap. I'm, I'm like, like over it. I'm gonna give you a heads up. I'd get on the boat. But if you choose not to get on the boat, I'm wiping it out. But he gave them years and decades of grace. He's given our people years and decades of grace. In fact, just thinking of these four horsemen coming, I was kind of terrorized with studying it this week. But then I'm like, well, that's really cool. He's actually giving us a warning. He's trying to give the world a warning. It's coming. Can you hear the galloping? They're ferocious. It's going to be terrible. Like, come to the Lord now because I will take you out of that. But if they don't listen, it's like it's going to happen. So let's read the passage and then we'll take our time and try to unpack it quickly. And I'll try to give you a few more details so it's not so confusing that it's understanding. But remember, this is a vision. And so it's got symbolic language and it's kind of a dark Western and we've got some horses. But let's try to make sure we don't miss. OK, what's the point here? Are you ready? OK, I'm in Revelation chapter six. If you're with us online, get your Bibles. Here we go, starting in verse 1. I watched, this is John, of course. I watched as the Lamb opened, this is Jesus. Remember, he's opening the seals now, the scroll. He opened the first of the seven seals. And then I heard one of the four living creatures, these are the seraphim and the cherubim, saying in a voice like thunder, come. And I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider had a bow and he had, was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. And then the lamb opened the second seal and I heard the second living creature say, come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one and its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other and to him was given a large sword and when then the lamb opened the third seal I heard the living creature say come and I looked and there before me was a black horse its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand and then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying Two pounds of wheat for a day's wage and six pounds of barley for a day's wages and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. And I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider's name was Death and Hades was following close behind. And they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by wild beasts of the earth. So there's our four horsemen. But he keeps going. He, he opened the fifth seal. And then I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. And they called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? 
Then each one was given a, a white robe and they were told to wait just a little longer until the number of the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. And then John says, I, I, I saw him open the, the sixth seal. There was a, a great earthquake and the sun turned black and the black as sath cloth made of like goat hair and the moon, the whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens were seated like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain island was removed from its place and then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, everyone else, both slave and free, they hid in caves and among the, the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lord. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who can withstand it? Yowzer. What a fun passage. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Okay, so let's unpack this. We're going to see seven seals. Six of them are in this chapter. He breaks them into like four seals, the four horsemen, and then three others. So it's, it's kind of interesting how he does that. Each of these horsemen are unique. They each have their own agenda. They each have their own message. We're to be courageous enough to face it, try to embrace reality, like take the red pill right now because like this isn't fun stuff. This isn't like, wow, I leave church feeling just so chipper. You know, it's like, you're, it's a little bit sobering today, but uh, let's unpack it. Are you ready? Let's go back to verse one. It says, I watch. That's I, John. I, John along with all true believers who will have already been removed, rescued, and raptured from this fallen, broken, crumbling world, watched, which is exactly what will happen for us if you know Christ personally when the rapture occurs. We're going to be watching these four horsemen from heaven. Praise God. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. I watched from our raptured place. I watched the earth, now that the Holy Spirit's been removed, now that the restraining force of evil uh, has been lifted, I watched this stampede of suffering, so look out Mufasa. I mean, here it comes. And then I heard of the four living creatures saying, come, like Jesus gave the thumbs up and the cherubim said, here we go. The day of grace is over. Judgment has come. It's going to start raining. Get on the boat. And I looked, and there before me, behold, like right in front of me was a white horse. And I don't know about you, but when I think white horse, I'm like, this is a good guy. I mean, praise God. I mean, a man of peace. This is going to be the hero, a savior, a messiah. Mr. Fixit has arrived. Like, the, the, I'm going to right all the wrongs. Like, this is like Superman. It's like the save the day dude. It's like it's a white horse. It's got to be good news. No, it's not. It's a counterfeit. A day's coming. We're going to be deceived. If we haven't already. <laughs> been deceived multiple times. You, you, you surely have heard political leaders say, uh, if you do, you can keep your doctor. Yeah, if you do, right. I mean, we're shocked when a politician actually does what he says. We're like, what? That's so amazing. Like he actually did what he promised. No, this is a conniving counterfeit, a cheat, a swindler, a deceiver, an imposter. This is a pretender. Uh, this is a, a white horse, but it's not the horse of Revelation 19, which Jesus will come on. This is a, a, a replica. This is a poser, a pretender. You know, secular humanists and Darwinists think man began so low, but he's rising and he's elevating and he's ascending and we're progressives because we're so progressive and we're making progress and mankind's getting better and better, whatever, <laughs> getting more and more deceived. And these progressives are always thinking it's not them that are the problem, it's always the externals. It's the environment, it's education, it's the parents, it's spouses, it's, it's society, it's, it's religion. It's not me, I'm always improving and involving and we can solve the world's problems and come up with a socialist utopian world it's all crazy 
whatever. Jesus is the only person who can bring true peace. He's the only person who's going to resolve all the problems that we're really talking about. And, but the world is so hungry for international peace that the bait of Satan, they'll just gobble it up. They're so hungry for security and safety, as we saw just with this recent pandemic. Um, it plays right in the hands of the Antichrist. It, it's just perfect. It, it, he's going to be able to deceive even Israel, according to Daniel 9. So he held a bow, which is a symbol of war, military power. It doesn't say in Revelation that the bow has any arrows. That's interesting because I've looked at different artists. In fact, one of the artists I picked actually has an arrow in the first horse, the white horse. But I'm like, that's an artist for you, not a theologian. <laughs> he doesn't have any arrows. Uh, I think that probably means it's going to be a bloodless conquest uh, at first. In other words, he's going to bring a false peace and security. He's going to lull us into, like, I can solve COVID for you. Like, I can fix. Like, if we just join the European Union, like, it'll all work out. You'll love it. You'll lose your private property, but you'll love it because the government will provide all your needs for you. Um, so the writer held a bow. He was given a crown, not the diadem, not a, not a royal crown, a stephanos, a temporary, like, uh, athletic crown. And uh, he's going to probably get this crown because he'll probably win the Nobel Peace Prize or something silly, you know, from the globalist who will affirm this amazing leader. And he's going to write in. He's going to be a conqueror because he's bent on conquest. But between you and I, I think this is the Antichrist. He's certainly not a Christ figure. He's the against Christ person. It's a deceptive piece. It's a counterfeit spirituality. It's what Paul talked about in 1 Thessalonians 5 while they were saying, peace and safety then destruction will come on them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with a child. And they're not going to escape. But this guy will be convincing. He's really going to bring, during the tribulation, seven years, the first three and a half are going to be pretty peaceful. He's going to woo people in. He's going to be really handsome and good looking. He's going to be the most interesting man in the whole world. And he's going to build the temple for the Jews. They're going to love him. And he's going to put together a ten confeder confederation of nations. And He's going to be kind of cool for a while. A and then the mask is going to come off and the charade and the shrow and the, the sham will be over. You'll realize he is a wolf in sheep's clothing, which, you know, we've already experienced that multiple times. He's, he's Jeffrey Epstein. I mean, this is Jesse Smollett. I mean, this is a, a, a dishonest uh, a journalist. This is a classic politician who says one thing and does something else. Uh, he's a liar. He comes on a white horse, but beware. Jesus gave this prediction, by the way, recorded for us in John 5. He said to the Jews of the time, I have come in my Father's name, and you don't receive me. If another comes in his own name, you'll actually receive him. I think he's referring to this, because Israel is going to receive him. They're going to sign a peace deal with this guy, and he's going to break it, and they're going to be doomed. Um, very interesting. Anyway, Satan always masquerades as an angel of light. He's very cunning and clever. He's coming on a white horse. He uses today outside the church things like Satanism, cults, false religion, half-truths, easy answers, lies, double standards, hypocrisy. You all see that. Inside the church, he uses false prophets, soft preaching. You know, people don't want sound doctrine. They want something that tickles the ears and makes them feel good and all kinds of stuff. So he's going to deceive in lots of layers. Anyways, that's horse number one. Fun, right? Ready? Horse number two. He opens a second seal. Uh, just as the woke are celebrating because peace has come and there's the, all this harmony and diversity, inclusion and equity and whatever. All of a sudden that's all shattered with horse number two. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come, verse four, then another horse came out, a fiery, bright red one. This is like scarlet blood. This is like crimson bloodshed. This is like an angry, hothead, global warfare kind of horse. And by the way, it's a red horse here in Revelation 6. It's going to be a red dragon in Revelation 12. It's going to be a red beast in Revelation 17. It's going to be Nazi red, Russian red, communist China red. It is angry and filled with animosity and temper and ire and fury and rage. And by the way, <laughs> let's not get too cocky, we're all warlike creatures, all of us. Anyone have a two-year-old here? Come on, anyone have a, right? Uh, uh, you've worked with adults. 
we pick fights. Stupid. Stupid fights. So, like, let's not, like, oh, there's Mr. Anger. It's like, uh, we're all prone. Its writer was given power, given permission to take or banish the peace from the earth. In other words, this horse was given power to defund the police, remove the restraints of evil, release prisoners, align with perpetrators and criminals, and allow people to turn to their own destructive instincts. Surprise, surprise. He's actually going to make people kill each other. He's going to create so much anarchy and civil disorder and racist tensions and all CRT and all kinds of stuff that brother will fight against brother and neighbor against neighbor. And we'll actually have like a red-blue divide in our own country. Like people won't realize, we're Americans. And like, okay, we have differences. Big surprise. Let's work them out. No, no, no. The, these can't be worked out because this is war. And to him was given a, a large sword on Makorea. This is like the sword of an, an assassin. So we've got the white horse, the de deception's coming in the future. War is coming in the future. Carnage. Now he sees a third horse. When the lamb opened the third seal, this leathery scroll gently kind of unrolls. He heard the living creature say, Come, and I looked, and there, like right before me, behold, was a black horse. This is like a, an ebony mare, an onyx stallion. And its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Scales are used for rationing. Uh, this is the result of a, a famine. And then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Hey, two pounds of wheat for a day's wage. And six pounds of barley for a day's wages. Okay, if you go in the original language, it actually says denarii. Denarii was a, a coin you earned for like a full day's wages. So he's like, you'll have enough now... Well, these prices here, two pounds for a wheat, is about eight to maybe 16 times the average price it would have been in Rome in the first century. <laughs> so there's inflation. Everything's really costly. Uh, don't damage the oil and, and the wine. In other words, basic sta staples are going to be super expensive. Um, the rich are going to get richer, the poor are going to get poorer, and the middle class is going to get completely impoverished. Surprise. And people are going to be killing each other for toilet paper. Can you imagine? <laughs> I mean, it's like, what? How, how could this be? This is a symbol. This black horse with the scales is a symbol of famine and poverty and massive hunger and starvation and economic oppression, inflation, scarcity, desperation. Um, because, of course, after you have all this deception and then this war, this red horse comes through the community, you can imagine, uh, land gets destroyed in wartime, uh, burned and ravaged, we're seeing this in the Ukraine, uh, farmers get killed, uh, there's limited food quantities, all of a sudden there's contaminated food supplies, the supply chain issues start to happen, disruptive distribution, water and sanitation issues, and then economic inflation and starvation, and just gets, it just rolls. And then, of course, remember during the tribulation, the mark of the beast is evident because uh, the, the future ruler is going to say, if you don't get vaxxed, there's going to be consequences. You can't board a plane. You can't keep your job. You can't stay a sheriff. You can't buy. You can't sell. If you don't align and get whatever this Antichrist tells you you have to get, you won't be able to buy and sell. Well, if you're a believer during that time, you're really going to starve because it's like, how are we going to do it? You know, how, we're going to have to find a, a way around. It's going to be super complicated. And of course, when you have war and famine, you start to have disease and emotional issues and scarcity and all kinds of stuff. Now, to you and I and those who are living with our own scarcity today, we're not to embrace this. Christianity is not about a famine mindset or mentality. It's not about a scarcity mindset. Christians are called to be like radically hospitable, extravagantly generous, even in the leanest of times. And we've had a lot of lean times over the, the years. But that's not who we are. So don't give in to that. Even though we're not going to live through the tribulation, which is the worst period, it could be a tough period coming ahead, apparently what the news is telling us. But even so, we're going to be radically generous and hospitable and charitable and share. And we're not going to give in to the scarcity mindset. Anyways, fourth seal. When the Lamb opened, verse 7, the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked before me, was a pale horse. 
an ashen horse. Uh, this is actually the Greek word chloros. Can you think of ing any English words that come from that? Chloros? Yeah, Clorox, chlorine, chlorophyll. It's actually like a yellow greenish color, translated here pale or ashen. It's basically a sickly color. It's the, Barclay calls it the color of a face that's blanched with terror. Um, it's the tint of terror. It's the pigment of panic. It's the hue of Hades. It's the color of a corpse the dye of demise and decomposition and death. And its writer's name was Death. And Hades, the realm of the dead, uh, was following like close behind. So this is like a vision of the grim reaper and the grave digger, like together. It's like, oh my goodness sakes. Um, death, of course, slays the body. Hades swallows up the soul. Death is physical death. Hades is spiritual death. So... I don't know, I, I kind of want to pause here and go, turn to the Lord now if you can. <laughs> like, I'm just saying, if you don't know Jesus, like, now's a really good time, like, let's do it. Anyways, they were given power over a fourth of the earth. In 1850, we had about a billion people on the planet. By like 1960, I think we had like three billion people. Today, we're almost at like eight billion. So a fourth of that is two billion people. That's a, that number, I can't even get, that's 2,000 millions. And I think America has like 300 and 350 million or so. So this is like 2,000 millions and our country is like 350 million. So it's like six of our whole populations is... It's a lot of people, however you, however you, <laughs> however you do the numbers. Uh, so they're given power over a fourth of the earth to kill four different ways by sword, famine, plague, could be translated pandemic. How could that happen? And by the wild beasts of the earth. I don't know. I don't think that's coyotes here in California <laughs> or something, but could be locusts, could be rats. Uh, wild beast is not a term about size. It's a term about like, e it's, it's like a potent evil. Could be little rats. I think the black death, right? Bubonic plague was like rats kind of took over. Um, so it could be that. Could be microscopic. Could be like something like HIV or E. coli or COVID. Like it could be a, a small beastly bacteria. Could be demons. I, I don't know. What I know is that Satan is going to come to steal, kill, and destroy it. And he's going to have a rampage. But Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it abundant. <laughs> so come to him, people. Please come. Okay, so there's our four horsemen. We're not even done. Okay, so the, we've got deception coming as a white horse. And then we've got war coming as like a red horse. And then we see this black horse, is, horse of famine and scarcity. And now a, a pale, like yellowish, greenish, like ashen death horse it's like oh my goodness this is a vision and don't get caught up in all the details just hear the hoofbeats like hear him like john is just trying to picture like oh my gosh the future the waves of what's coming is just overwhelming it's like it's not going to be pretty but if you're a believer you're safe if you're not a believer it's like times look the clock is ticking down people it's it's like it, it's going to be tough now the fifth seal, verse 9, when he opened the fifth, I saw under the altar um, souls, not bodies, because they're not embodied in heaven, but souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. He, he actually gets a vision that during the tribulation, you think, well, will anyone come to Christ after we're raptured? Yes, <laughs> they are. In fact, next week, we're going to see in chapter 7, which is going to blow your mind, the greatest revival that's ever happened in human history happens during the tribulation. Is that God or what? In the worst of times, he's going to make it the best time spiritually. That's God. Like, even when you think, okay, we are, this stampede, we're, anyone who's left is doomed. Well, you are, but you could still come to Christ. Trust me, if all of us know Christ and the rapture happened today and we were gone, a lot of people you know are going to be going, wow, it's so interesting. That whole 
Bridge family is gone. Wow. Um, wow, Dave and Sue are gone. So is Chase. I mean, people are going to have some questions. People are going to be going, well, maybe they were on to something. Now, most people are going to double down and go, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, people still want to stay stuck in their ways. They, they don't want to give up their sin. They, they're, they're, but some are going to get it. And this is what John's getting a vision of. By the way, he saw when the fifth seal opened under the altar, there were actually people who had been martyred because of the word of God, because they shared and preached and taught the word. They came to Christ during the tribulation and the testimony of them was maintained. They were loyal to Christ in it. So like, they're, you know, time hasn't been done. So they're under the altar. They're just in a waiting period. But there's going to be great persecution. But some are going to realize, you know what? I'm not buying this lie. Like they're going to, there, there are people now who are so over COVID. Like you can mandate whatever you want. We're over it. <laughs> we're not doing it. People are like done, done. And in the tribulation, there's going to be people like, we're done with the lies. No, we don't believe the Antichrist. We reject the fake news. We're going to oppose government tyranny. We're not going to collude with the state. We're going to resist cancel culture. We're not going to comply with mandates. We're just over it. And it's like, well, then we'll probably kill you. And it's like, take me. Because they're like, I already know people who've already gone before. I'm already starting to believe that. I didn't believe it. I was wavering. I was on the fence. I was like half-hearted. I was a little bit lukewarm, but I'm hot now. Like, they're going to they're gonna figure it out. And by the way, during the tribulation, we'll see next week in chapter 7, God's going to raise up 144,000 Jews to become evangelists during the tribulation. So cool. In chapter 11, he's going to raise up two witnesses. In chapter 14, an angel is going to share the gospel. So even though this seven-year period is going to be a train wreck, God's not done. Like he, he, the fact that he gives people more chances. I mean, this is like him saying it during the flood, you know, get on the boat. Okay, now it starts to rain. He closes the boat and then gets in a little life raft and is going around. Anyone left still? Like, like he's still giving people chances. Verse 10, and they called out these, these martyrs in a loud voice. How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, like totally separate from evil, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth? I mean, when are you going to deal with ISIS, Al-Shabaad, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, Boko Haram, Hamas? When are you going to deal with the, the IRA, MS-16, the tyrants of the progressive West? Like, when are you going to avenge their blood? Like, we just got martyred for standing up for you, but we're not in the age of grace anymore. It's not like Stephen. When Stephen was martyred, the first martyr of the church, he was like, Lord, don't count it against them. Like, he was like, we're still in an age of grace. Like, please don't punish them. Don't judge them. But these, these have already, they're in the age of judgment now. And they're like, Lord, now we're in the age, you don't need to give grace anymore. Time's over. The clock ran out. Like, how long until you avenge? This is like an imprecatory prayer or a psalm. You know, in the psalms, there's some psalms that, oh, Lord, when are you going to avenge my enemies? Like, when are you going to, like, come on, make it right. And uh, they just want justice and holiness and truth. But verse 11 says, each of them will be given a white robe. Okay, so you're going to get this long flowing stole, you know, signifying high status, purity, majesty, brilliance. And they were told, you're going to have to wait a little longer. Like, I'm going to avenge it, but I'm not done. Like, I still think I can save some people in the tribulation. So I know, I know, I know we're in the age of, we're typically in the age of judgment, but I'm still going to try to give them a little more time until the full number, full number of your fellow servants and brothers and sisters were killed just as you've been. Like there's more people who are going to stand up for Christ and they're going to get killed and they're going to join you and stuff, but we're going to give people more time. It's like, wow. Super cool. I don't know, I was reading Revelation 10 and it says in their stomach it'll be bitter but in their mouth it'll be sweet. Talking about the ambivalence of this judgment is on one level it's bitter because it's like I really don't want to see people hurt and die but it's kind of sweet too because finally like it's over like we're tired of taking the crap. And uh, this, these martyrs are told I'll make it right but give me a little more time. I mean just it, maybe one more person will be saved. Lord is super patient, right? Not wanting any to perish, right? He doesn't. He really doesn't. <laughs> Anyways, verse 12, we've got to keep going. I watched as he opened, finally, our final seal for today. The sixth seal, there's a great seismos, Greek for earthquake. We have the English word seismic from it. Um, there's a great earthquake, which, by the way, there was when Moses came down from Sinai, when Elijah called on God, when 
Jesus died, there was a great, like he's used earthquakes before, Paul and Silas when they're in jail. Let's go with an earthquake. Let's just shake it up a little bit while we let him out. Um, So the whole planet was shaking. The tectonic plates were moving, which by the way, they have been very fluid since the flood, by the way. You won't learn that in school, but anyways, the sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. It's, it turned really black. Probably, too, if you have seismic activity, you could have volcanic eruptions. You could have ash starting to leak into the air. You could see that starting to block the sun, and um, then the whole moon turned blood red, and the stars, this is the Greek word asteros, We actually get asteroids from it or an asterix, a little star symbol. Um, So I think it's probably better translated asteroids, these stars falling from the sky or asteroids or meteors or comets. We'll talk to Jim later and find out for sure. Um, But they fell to the earth as as like kind of green figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken from a strong wind. So like they just were falling on the earth. And then the heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up. I love Isaiah 42, 5. It says God stretched out the heavens. You know, he stretched it out. And we're learning, of course, from science that the universe is ever expanding. So I'm like, yes, I love it when it affirms what scripture says. And, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to kind of roll up. And every mountain and island is going to be removed from its place. There's going to be a lot of shifting and movement and people are going to try to escape to the islands and they're going to realize some of them are submerged probably it's like oh my gosh there's a some call it a nuclear winter i don't know it's just frightful whatever it is but verse 15 says and i love this part because now we're going to deal with the elites you know we have a lot of elites in our culture that want to tell us what to do that reject god and they like putting you in your place and telling you they have a better plan for your life. You can't self-govern. Let us like, tell you everything to do, for everything from light bulbs you have to put in your home to what you need to put in your body. They, they think they know everything. Well, when this happens, these elites, it says the kings of the earth, that's the ultimate government authorities. This is Biden and Macron and Merkel and Trudeau and Putin and Xi and Kim Jong-un and you name it. The kings of the earth... The princes, these are world leaders that are a little less, the Harris's, the Schumer's, the Pelosi's, the Schiff's, uh, the generals, the Lloyd Austin's, the General Milley's, the rich, uh, the Bezos, the Bloomberg's, the Buffett's, the Gates, uh, the mighty, could be the Zuckerberg's, the Klaus Schwab's of the World Economic Forum, Larry Fink of BlackRock, and everyone else, great and small. This could be... Damon and De Niro, all of our Hollywood friends, Maddow and Michael Moore and Joe Behar, you know, she's going to lose her joy because uh, and Jim Carrey's going to be dumb and dumber uh, when this comes around. I'd, DiCaprio thinks he went down on the Titanic. He's going way down with Whoopi Goldberg and Sean Penn and Brian Stelter and Amy Schumer and Jim Acosta and everyone else that is there, both slave and free. They're going to hide in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. In other words, all the people that are anti-you, all those people that put down God, all those people that don't want prayer in school, all those people that think Christians are dumb, all those people that have had their way, they've had their time to rule and govern, they've shown their cards, they don't give a hoot about you, they care about their agenda, their Green New Deal, their utopian vision, they don't care about your liberty, they don't care about your personal life, they don't care if it costs you your job. These people who, you know... God forbid you storm the Capitol. They're going to put you in jail. They're going to do whatever they're going to do. These people are going to hide when the tribulation comes. And then they're going to call to the mountains and the rocks. It's going to be so bad. They're going to call to Mother Nature, not God. You'd think it would be a great time for them to go, oh my goodness, we've blown it. Like we need to turn to God. No, no. No, this is time to double down. We're going to turn to nature, the green God. And we're going to say, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. I mean, the only time they saw Jesus angry was probably in the temple if they knew anything about biblical history. The one time he overturned a table like that. Oh my gosh. Oh no. He's coming back with a sword, people. This isn't Christmas. This isn't little Jesus, baby Jesus. So cute. So cute. No, he's not cute. 
So they're going to have a worldwide prayer meeting. They're going to be calling out, but not to God. They're going to call out to the environment, the universe. I hope that works for them. They're going to call out to Dr. Kevorkian is who they're going to call to. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand it? See, the day of the Lord is called the destruction from the Almighty in Joel, the time of fury and burning in Isaiah, a time of doom, Ezekiel, a great and very awesome moment in Joel, darkness and not light in Amos. Who can stand? Well, I'll tell you right now who can stand. You can stand. You could stand through this if you have Christ. And you will. Next week, when we get to chapter 7, you're going to find out there's some other people who are going to stand too. They're going to get, they're going to get it. It's fi finally, during the tribulation, the light's going to go on. Now, for those of you who are tempted to say, well, I want to do my own thing now and then I'll just come to Christ now in the tribulation. Now that I know that's an option, I'm like, <laughs> go for it. Uh, I mean, if you want to go that way, but if you won't give your life to Christ now when you could live, why would you give your life to Christ then when it will cost you your life? You will be martyred if you come during the tribute. Those are going to be legit people to meet in heaven. Super legit. And it's going to be awesome. So we need to close. Where does our time go? It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a, the living God. Uh, come to him now. So my closing thoughts are horses are fascinating, but these are terrifying. <laughs> these are four incredibly dark, crazy horses, but it's a warning. It's a warning of a horror on the horizon. It's a warning of a future fear. It's a warning of a prophetic picture of the end of history. These war horses aren't really to scare us. They're to clarify for us, my goodness, if you're in Noah's age, get on the boat. If you're in the age of grace, come to Christ because the world is a bad, dark western and the sheriff that's coming is not a good dude. And the first horse that's come is going to be very deceptive. He's going to promise you peace. He's going to say stuff. Don't even believe it because right after that will come the red horse of war and then the black horse of famine and then the pale, greenish, weird, ashen horse of death and right behind is Hades. In other words, when you die, if you don't know Christ, then hell is next. And this is not just to scare John or scare us. He's trying to give us a vision of the Lion King stampede and say, Simba, don't go down in the gorge. There's not going to be Mufasa to save you. He can save you now. And this is just a loving father trying to give clear boundaries to his kids and clear consequences. Don't touch that or you're going to get spanked. Like, don't do that or you're going to go to your room. Don't do that or you're going to lose your phone. Don't do that or you're going to die. And hell will be your outcome. Come now. I don't know, maybe I'll close with this. I was looking at Luke 12 and Jesus said, uh, some of you know this verse already, but he says, I warn you whom to fear. Because I'm thinking, this is kind of scary. Fear the one who after he has killed has the authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, he says, fear him. <laughs> Don't fear the future. Don't fear the tribulation. Don't fear, uh, the world is dicey. It's been dicey for centuries. Fear not knowing God. You know. Let's fear him. Let's honor him. Let's respect him. Because he wants to save us right now. And even in the tribulation, he's going to give opportunities to save us again. And even when things get worse and worse, he's going to... So he's like really for us. But today, he's warning us. Can you hear the gallops? They're coming. They're coming. And I want you to see the matrix of what's behind all the stuff so you don't get like trapped in it. Amen? Oh my gosh. <laughs>